Good morning. I'm Charles Huckabee, and I want to welcome you to our annual archives tour here in the library. Um, our, we do one of these each semester. The purpose of that is to show off over a little bit, a little sneak preview of over half a million items that we have in our archives. And so we're very excited to showcase some for you today. Um, as you would imagine, because we're a Baptist institution, we have lots of things related to Baptist history. And throughout Baptist history, we've had lots of heroes. Uh, we've had trailblazers, we've had theologians, we've had pastors, but no heroes greater than our missionaries. And within the last hundred years, we have had uh, one man who has made quite the impact on Southern Baptist missions and has been inspirational uh, to millions, and that is Bill Wallace of China. And so we're excited today to have our Dean of Libraries, Dr. Craig Kubik, to tell us more about Bill Wallace of China. Dr. Kubik is married to his wife, Donna. They are active not only in the seminary, but in their local church and community. And so we're excited to have Dr. Kubik here today to tell us about Bill Wallace. Dr. Kubik. Well, good morning and thank you for coming, our visitors from uh, outside the seminary. and. Uh, thanks to my colleagues uh, who are here supporting me and being, having been patient with me for, as Ms. Uh, Walker nods her head in the back there, for uh, over a year as I've looked at the Bill Wallace material. Uh, Bill Wallace, uh, of course, is well known to most Southern Baptists, but uh, others may not realize that there was a church named after him in Knoxville, Tennessee. That's his hometown, and that's the Bill Wallace Memorial Baptist Church. And at that church, uh, the pastor, Dr. Jim McCluskey, had the idea, the vision, to collect material on Bill Wallace. And he commissioned uh, a retired librarian by the name of Jane Powell to actually begin the work. And it was their desire to collect the material on Dr. Bill Wallace. So they set it in their minds and they began to write letters to all the different missionary friends that he had been in contact with. And they also got in contact with the Foreign Mission Board and, and other friends uh, in the community to collect the material. Of course, you know that uh, Dr. Jesse Fletcher wrote the book, Bill Wallace of China, and most of you, or many of you, may have read it. And we have for you today a copy of it, as well as a copy of the movie that was made later by uh, uh, Greg Walcott. So we'll have that for you today. But there are some things in the book that uh, were not available at the time uh, that have come to light. Uh, it doesn't really change our opinion or our understanding of Bill Wallace, but it uh, actually gives a greater uh, view of the person and the missionary martyr that he really was, the passion he had for doing the job that he intended to, to do. So I'm going to take you through. Mrs. Walker is going to be my timekeeper. She's my boss for the day. And, uh, and I have to tell you, I had a whole lot more material out. And between Miss Barbara and Miss Jill, we were able to weed it down. So there was just too much to show. And I could uh, talk for a long time. She said I could get done around 5 o'clock today, maybe. <laughs> so. So I'll try to try to go faster than that. I want to uh, show some documents, uh, look at some little pieces of, of the original letters, and then I'm going to read a couple of documents that, uh, that uh, Dr. Fletcher did not have access to that, that will later come to light. And uh, there are still some things that are going to be uh, shown in our digital archive as uh, are available because there were recordings done uh, by, the, uh, by them during the 1980s that are going to be digitized and will show up on our digital archive. So a lot of good stuff. So if you want to follow along with your page, you'll be able to see generally where we are, and I'll, you, you'll, I'll pull out portions of that uh, so that you'll see on the screen. So let's, uh, let's start, and we're going to really go off with a run here. If I can get it to go ahead. All right, so here we're looking at 
the general timeline. He was born there in 1908 in Knoxville, Tennessee. His mom and his dad, uh, they had two, two children, of course, Bill and his sister Ruth. Ruth has only one son whose name is Sidney as well as her husband who married a Sidney Stegall. And so their son is named Sidney Stegall Jr. and he goes by Sandy. That name you'll see later on in my presentation. And Sandy is still alive. He has one living relative and he is in Seattle. I had the pleasure of talking to him a couple of weeks ago after finally tracking him down and he promises to do an oral history interview with me later on in the year. So I have to gather a few extra little insights from it. So Bill uh, is the only son. His dad is a doctor, so he's already coming from a me medical background. But Bill doesn't have uh, the real interest in the beginning in medicine. He is more interested in mechanical things. He's known for being able to put things together. He even builds a car on his own in his garage. Uh, but he helps his dad, at, and you can see at the age of 10 or 11, he gets a special driver's license to help his dad come home from medical uh, appointments that are late at night. So I thought to myself, how many of us would have a 10-year-old drive us around on the freeway here in, in Dallas-Fort Worth? Not likely, but I'm sure it was a lot different in Knoxville in that day. So his mother died in 1919, and after that he became very, very close to his, uh, his dad, and uh, they were best friends, I would say, for all the time that his dad was alive. But then in 1925, he feels called to become a medical missionary, and he's actually working in his garage in the gar on the car, and he actually takes his Bible, goes to the back of the garage, and writes in his New Testament that he feels called to be a missionary there. Unfortunately, we don't have the Bible. I wish we did. That would be cool. All right, so he goes on to, to work in church work. He does a little volunteer and then he becomes an orderly at a hospital, goes on to medical school in Memphis, and then he graduates. So let his father dies in 1932 there. So let's take a look at some of the pictures of what our bill looks like. So here's, uh, here's our bill as a, as a little boy there uh, from the period. This is just a, a small photo of, of what we have of him here. He's looking sort of like Alfalfa from uh, our gang there. Uh, and ever so much more in this one with the little cap. Uh, so he's, uh, now here he is, he's growing up, getting a little bigger. And now here's our big uh, photo that I would say he'd probably in, be embarrassed today if I showed this to, to you. But there he is in his, in his very stylish swimsuit because he, he played tennis and liked to swim. So that's what uh, his athletic interests were. All right, so now let's look at what happens in the next couple years. In 1933, he's, uh, he interns at the General Hospital in Knoxville. He's, he goes into the military, serves for a couple of years, but he's assigned to the hospital there. He becomes a house physician at Knoxville General Hospital. And then in 1935, he, he resigns his commission and he's appointed as a medical missionary and Broadway Baptist Church, his, his, the church where he was um, a member, they actually supported him financially. They made the contribution to the Foreign Mission Board to pay for all of his expenses, his, his salary, his transportation, as well as medical supplies for the hospital. So here we have Bill in his smart and dapper looking uh, military outfit. How about those pants there for you? So we actually have over here, we have one of a couple of the documents. One is uh, his uh, commission from the United States. That's a copy that we have. And the original is in the Clay County 
Historical Society Museum in Knoxville, and I had a chance to look at the original. They have two documents on Bill Wallace in Knoxville, and that's one of them. And then this is an original copy, and you'll see it over on the, on the table. This is his uh, City of Knoxville agreement where he's paid $90 a month to, to be the house physician in, in Knoxville. So it, things are very nice for him there. He's, he continues and as uh, the, the surgeon or the doctor there. And these are some of the first babies that he delivered. There's a, a set, his first set of twins and the nurses that are there. And so these twins happen to have the photos left and they made a donation to the, to the collection. Bill Wallace there. Now this hospital that he served at actually still exists. It was not knocked down. Here it is. I'm standing in front of it. It's an Alzheimer's unit these days. Thus all of the, the uh, security around the building. And that is where he worked. It's not very, it doesn't look very big compared to today's standards of hospitals. And now, here's a nice photo of the hallway as it looked then. And actually in Knoxville, the Broad, the uh, Bill Wallace Memorial Baptist Church does a historical tour of the places of Bill Wallace. And they actually dress in character and this small room where you see the, where the refrigerator is, that is where his office was, and that is where he writes his letter to uh, the Foreign Mission Board explaining and saying that he's interested. And I want to read for you a little bit about what he says to the Foreign Mission Board. He says, my name is William L. Wallace, and I am now serving as a resident in surgery at Knoxville General Hospital. Since my senior year in high school, I felt God would have me to be a medical missionary, and to that end, I have been preparing myself. I attended the University of Tennessee for my med pre-medical work and received the MD from the University of, of Memphis. I did an internship here at Knoxville General and remained for surgery residency. I'm not sure what you desire by way of information. I am single, 26 years old, and a member of Broadway Baptist Church. My mother died when I was 11, and my father, also a physician, passed away two years ago. There were only two of us. My sister and Ruth Lynn is planning marriage. I must confess, I am not a good speaker nor apt as a teacher, but I do feel God can use my training as a physician. As humbly as I know how, I want to volunteer to serve as a medical missionary under the Southern Baptist Foreign Mission Board. I have always thought of Africa, but I will go anywhere I am needed. And that's what he sent to them. All right. so. He is accepted. Here's a little humorous point that happens to occur. So he's, uh, he's accepted, more or less, at that point. And, and Dr. Madry, who is the, the president of the Foreign Mission Board, writes him back. And you will see here at the bottom, and I, let's read, we can read it there. Uh, let's see. If you have found a wife by the time, by that time, or have the prospect, Bring her on with you that I may see her and make some decision about her support. If you've not found a wife by that time, I think I can help you meet several fair <laughs> ladies at Ridgecrest. By the way, the Badoes, who was the doctor in, in Wuchow, where he was going, uh, have two beautiful, charming daughters who will be at Ridgecrest this week. All right, so <laughs> I thought uh, <laughs> we probably wouldn't write that letter this, these days. <laughs> But I thought it was, what would he think? All right. Now, uh, as he prepares to go and he's approved, he uh, is supported by the Broadway Baptist Church. And we uh, received the original copy of his farewell address to the church. And uh, it is located in this cabinet right over here next to the pot. 
It's the uh, original handwriting that he did. I don't know how it survived, but uh, when I went to pick up the collection in Knoxville, uh, the uh, committee was there and there was a little bit of flurry because I could tell something special was going on or they were, they were gonna do something unique. And, and so one of the uh, committee people comes rushing in and she says, I have it. And it was this original copy uh, that they had, I guess, stored somewhere else. And so it's a, it's a precious document to us to have his farewell address written out. And I, I want to read again to you a couple little points. It goes on and on, but here are the, the main gist of what he wants to say about going, because he already knows he's going to, to China. I want to express to you my sincere and heartfelt appreciation in making it possible for me to go to China as your missionary, your ambassador for Jesus Christ. You may ask why I want to go to China and there spend my life and energy. You might say there's much to be done in this country and many of you said that I can do a lot of good here. Why should I go? when there's much such hardship and inconveniences? The only answer is that, is that God has a plan that I go. <clears throat> and God's call is so definite to me. I think he made it definite to me so that there would be no doubt in my mind as to God's plan, so that through the long years of preparation there would be no doubt that, no doubt that I was doing God's will. I want to go to China because someone has prayed and God heard these prayers and answers as he always does when God's people pray. I would rather be doing, going out as God's missionary this morning than anything else in the world. There is one final word of request that I leave with you and it is this, that you would pray for me, pray daily that this, your humble servant's ministry and work, might be all that God would have it to be. He f definitely felt that he had been preparing to be a missionary. And this is the pulpit that he gave that address from. It's in the front of the Broadway church, and uh, uh, they don't use it anymore except as a little, little point of interest there. Um, they, this is a copy of the bulletin from the church the day he left to go to China. And there's a nice little comment here where he thanks them as well as the pastor saying that one of theirs is going out. And at that point, at the conclusion of the church service, over 200 of them walked him to the train. And this is... Uh, train of the same vintage that uh, he rode on. But this is the station where he, he left from. And during the Wallace tour, they, all those who go on the tour board the train and sit there together as, uh, as though he's going, they're going with him. So here are, he gets on a boat, uh, leaves out of San Francisco and, and heads for China. And he's not the only missionary going to China at that time. This is the whole crew that's going. This is Ruth Ford up here in the corner. She's going there in, into the same area. And here's our Bill looking down there. But this is the group that's going in 1935. To, to China. Now they also, I had to show, have to show this next picture. I've lost my mouse here temporarily. Here's our bill in Hawaii. They stop in Hawaii. How about that? You can see the mountains in the background there. He's very trim and very thin and obviously very athletic there. And so he stops in Hawaii, in Oahu. And so they're on their way to, to China. And here is from, our, from the collection, Wu Chow is there from, from an old uh, National Geographic. But if you want to see where it really is, that's where Wu Chow is. 
what did he find when he, when he got there? This is what Wu Chao looked like. On the hill is uh, the pagoda. So it's way up there. So you can tell it looks pretty much like what you would expect in, in mainland China in, the 19, in 1935. And here we go with, he's at language school, <coughs> the other friends that are there. And this is the front of uh, the hospital, Stout Memorial Hospital there. It had uh, the main entrance and it had two wings on it. And that hospital is still around. And it has been visited by others in 1987. And so this is what it looks like. It's now the work, workman, workers hospital. You can see stout was covered over and the cross is now made into look like the red cross. And uh, so it's still, it's still around. Okay, let's take a quick look at what's going to happen in the next couple years to, to, our, to Bill. So he goes to, goes to language school, and we know that Dr. Bill had a hard time with tones. And if my understanding from, uh, from uh, Chinese, that Chinese language is very tonal. So he had great difficulty with that, and so they even send a language teacher to be with him beyond uh, language school to help him out there. And so uh, that, uh, that, stays, that person stays for a little while, but then you know the, the Japanese-Chinese War begins and the war, World War II is already in, in going, starting. And we have a time when Wu Chao was bombed in 1937 and in 1938, refugees are coming in, there's uh, famine, lack of food, uh, disease. It's a very hard time in China. And the Stout Memorial Hospital was the largest hospital abroad at the, in the day. It was the pre, like a premier hospital in, in the world, given the fact that it was there in China, actually. They had things that were not available anywhere else. And Dr. Bill was a surgeon. He had already been accepted in the American Academy of Surgeons. So we, he was one of the very few missionaries to have the, the skills and had passed the test and achieved such a, a noteworthiness for his abilities. So <coughs> our Bill, uh, we ask, uh, did he ever marry? No, he never married. Uh, some would say he was married to his job. But he did have, this is his first love, Lily Mae Hilton. And this is a picture of her, and, and here she is. They double dated, I think whoever took the photo is, 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 on, is on this double date, Lily Mae. That she went to Ridgecrest with him. And so uh, we, we know that uh, she, I think she did not want to go as a missionary, or it never really uh, became deep enough that, that they married. So we find, and I have the document over here on, on, on the table, a letter from June 1936. So it's in that first period here. And it's a letter that's been torn in half and we're missing the bottom half of it. So we don't get everything, but, but the second page is probably the best part here, and we'll, let me jump to it now here. I'm going to step over here and try to read it if you can't make it out here. We'll remember that I said one night that our happiest times together were when we were true friends and nothing deeper, and I believe this is the view that you have held to. I know God has a plan for your life, and I will pray for you, and we'll continue, and I trust that he has a plan for my life. And I would not do anything that would interfere with God's plan for your life. And I would be something God and we don't know. 
but I think there's enough to tell that in this letter, we, I don't know, no document, no, nothing that we can find tells me where this came from. However, in a month, I'm going to visit with Dr. McCluskey, and I'm hoping he will tell me where this document came from. And how it, how it survived is one of the very few letters that Bill sent to, that, that we have. By the way, he doesn't write very much at all. All right, but from, from the few letters that we have, we do have uh, um, enough that we can see. Unfortunately, ours are photocopies. They are not the originals. They could have been in Ruth Stiegel's collection, and she allowed them to make a copy of it. Uh, according to, uh, to Sidney Jr., in his garage in Seattle, are boxes full of material from his mom's home in Knoxville. He promises upon retirement at the end of this semester to go through it and hopefully we can recover some of the original documents that are here. So this one is from 1936 and he's talking down here. You'll be able to eventually, if you look closely, you'll see that the USS Mindanao is in the river there, and Mindanao was important in the World War II. And so they are patrolling the area while the war is getting cranked up. But I like, most of all, the way he consistently signs, and you'll see it here shortly, to his sister here, be good and don't worry for uh, I am safe. He always does that with a great, something very similar to that with, a, with emphasis. Here's, uh, uh, here's the text. I'll have that if anybody wants to see it. Here's another one from September 1937. Dear sister, and the, uh, some other missionaries are coming in, and at the bottom you'll see that he's planning to send uh, his nephew, an ivory ball. He says, well, be good. And now look at the way he's writing. Don't worry about me. It's a little bolder yet. And here's the, the text of that. One more letter. And this time you'll see there are 11 planes that made the drop in Wu Chow dropped bombs, there were machine guns uh, thereby, the hospital shook, it was a new experience to me today. Please don't worry about me. And he always, he signs, sincerely Bill, to his, to his sister. I don't know, I guess I would sign it love, <laughs> but he signs them sincerely. Uh, and now another one. This is from 1938. Uh, uh, as the years are going by, his handwriting seems to be getting a little worse. Have you noticed the, the here? Uh, and it is a day when they have dropped uh, bombs on the hospital, but all are safe. So perhaps he's a little shaken by this day here. Uh, and he says, don't worry, we are all safe. Don't have time to write more. Don't worry, don't worry. He's constantly saying that. And Miss Walker, how am I doing for time? <laughs> talk, talk faster, talk fast. Okay, so they even bothered to take the time to give us a map and they show where the, where the bombs uh, fell and that's available for you there. It's amazing that no one was really hurt. Pictures from the day where it really did do devastation to, to the hospital, but they managed to repair it. So let's jump to the next segment of time that uh, was there. He takes his first vacation, he goes up the river. I, it's hard for me to imagine going on vacation during a war, right? But he goes on, he takes a couple months, goes up and looks around. Wu Chow is still being bombed. Dr. Badeau, who is the hospital administrator, is, uh, goes on furlough, 
and then uh, Dr. Wallace returns in 1941, uh, goes on furlough, and he studies in, in Pennsylvania and, and Harvard, and then he returns back to Wu Chow. At the same time in 1941, we know Pearl Harbor is bombed there. So a lot of things going on during this time period, but he does manage to, to go back and forth. So here we have Bill, 1941 on his first furlough back to the United States. Other pictures I've seen of him, he looks pretty thin. He's not so bad there. Maybe he's come home, had uh, the opportunity to speak at some churches, and, and I understand Ruth was a very good cook. And it's at this time <coughs> we see another young lady step back in to step into his life, and her name is Miss Newton. And she was Dr. Madry's secretary there. Nothing ever became of this. Uh, I guess they did date quite a bit. She was born in China and grew up there, but she apparently had no interest in going back to live in China permanently. So while they were friends, the, the relationship did not deepen. We have a few letters from her in our collection, but she really doesn't tell us much. She says, read the little bit that's in Dr. Fletcher's book, and she cites the page even in, in, to look for it. That she says, that's more or less me. But she was not interested in it, but he had an interest in her at that time. All right, let's take another quick look here. I have to say, uh, uh, let me check here. Uh, the Hong, Hong Kong is captured by the Japanese. The hospital in Kuailing is, uh, is burned. The foreign mission board asks everyone to leave, and it said, uh, but he does not. He stays there. And then the, it is at this time period that the hospital is actually placed on barges and moves down the river. But in 19, this 1945, 44, <coughs> this is the section in our archive that we have very little documents. There's nothing much that's there. We know only from the Foreign Mission Board reports, but not much from Bill, not much from others. So it's only what we can learn from others that are there. Okay, Lucy Wright uh, arrives from the United States. She's uh, one of the missionary uh, nurses there. And so uh, Stout Memorial Hospital is rebuilt. Let's, <clears throat> so because there's so little, let's take a quick overview of what's going to be the final years in his life there. Dr. Badeau uh, returns. Dr. Wallace goes on furlough in 19. 46. Comes back in 47. And 47, we see the appearance of a very important name in the life of, of our understanding of Bill Wallace, and that's Everly Hayes. It's through her eyes that we really know a lot about Bill Wallace in the, la in the last years there. Okay, the rivers flood, the communists march closer and closer. In 1949, they take over. Uh, 1950, of course, December 9th, Bill Wallace is jailed, and I will talk a little more about that. He dies February the 10th, all during the time that he, he's un, she's under house arrest. Uh, but then in 1985, uh, Bill Wallace's ashes are returned. So there, now I'll try to fill in from the documents a little bit more uh, on this whole period. Here he is in 1946. He's studying in Chicago. There he is at the, at the Broadway Baptist Church. And the WMU shows up uh, dressed in their Chinese costumes for, for him, which I thought was very uh, amusing. OK, during this time, he is, there is an occasion that he goes to, he's studying in uh, New Orleans. He goes to New Orleans to Tulane to the Institute of Tropical Medicine, 
and it's at this time that he actually comes in contact with a librarian. So here's our, our librarian segment. He dates the librarian, uh, Nell Davidson, and uh, she writes uh, a little booklet that was never published about his time in New Orleans. Um, she's a little self-serving, perhaps, in this. You'll see here uh, the way she uh, comes down here. At the time, I certainly had no intention of falling in love. Such opportunities had passed over in favor of librarianship. I never thought of being a librarian as such a hardship. <laughs> I had already held three library positions during this period of 11 years. So it's a little bit of her uh, story, too, in this. So apparently, uh, only a couple uh, months ago, I met some older graduates from New Orleans Seminary who happened to know Miss Nell. And I asked them, well, what was she like? <clears throat> and they told me that she was a very difficult person. <laughs> Mildly put <laughs> there. So bless poor Miss Nell's heart. But apparently she, she was in love with, with Bill and you know, nothing came of it after all. So he was truly married to being a missionary. Okay, so he returns and now um, a lot of the story that we know about Bill comes from the writing of Everly Hayes, who was his nurse, stayed there and was present. She wrote to her parents uh, every day, mailed a letter every third or fourth day. It was a day-to-day -day account. We know the, some of Bill's quirks and things that he liked to do from her letters almost exclusively. And, and Mrs. Walker has enjoyed <laughs> listening to me for months on end, reading little segments of the letters. Oh, Bill did this, oh, this happened. And uh, you, when you read it and it was over, you know, 50 years ago or whatever, uh, it's still, it can still be moving when you hear about it. So we're gonna take a look at the letters from, from Everly Hayes that's there. And this one, she arrives there and I'm gonna, uh, step around here so you can see, so I can see it. This is her first letter to mom and dad describing Bill Wallace there. Uh, you're wondering what uh, uh, Dr. Wallace is like. He's not handsome no. there, and he's getting slightly bald. Thank you, <laughs> Everly, for giving that. They would say he would forget to eat if they didn't insist he'd eat now and, now and then. He's tall and long-legged, doesn't bother about dressing. He, he wants to live on the same scale as the Chinese doctors, so there will be no dissatisfaction. Uh, he is quite disappointed that we didn't, didn't come on up. They were in the country and they had not been able to get there. He needs male companionship. Uh, he is very nice. There. So he didn't have a whole lot of uh, Westerners that were males in the area at that time. So what does Bill's handwriting, what does he write at this time? Look at his handwriting in 1948 there. Well, at this point, he's actually very sick from paratyphoid type A. So you can tell, dear chief there, how are you? I'm better now and I'm able to sit up and write a letter. Give my love to Sister and Sandy, Bill. Some of the other places he writes William there. So he's, uh, he, he call, who is chief? That's his brother-in-law. That's Sidney Sr. He always called him chief. And by the way, chief was responsible for getting a lot of the medical supplies, including a elevator from the United States to Wuchow up the river and it was paid for by the state of Missouri where Everly Hayes was from Missouri. And now here's a letter that uh, Everly Hayes writes and in all of the uh, correspondence and, and all of the recounting of of different missionaries who were interviewed, the, they all will bring up the story 
a Bob the dog. Bob the dog sticks out in their, their minds, and I am, I am a dog lover. Jill's a dog lover, and any other dog lovers here will, will uh, feel sorry about this situation. Well, apparently, uh, Bob the dog uh, had, was used for a demonstration there uh, on, in surgery, and so the doctor used him, cut him open, and sewed him back together. And Everly's tell, you, they use morphine, and that the dog trusted Everly so much and uh, that he would be okay. So Dr. Bill took him back to his apartment so that he could, could watch him and that he would be okay. A and so unfortunately, so there you go, unfortunately, poor Bob, poor Bob there. Dr. Bill was so exhausted, he fell asleep, and the poor doggy pulled the stitches out and, and passed away. And all the nurses were really angry with Dr. Bill that he didn't take care of poor Bob the, the, the dog. And that made me disappointed in Bill, too, <laughs> that, poor, that the dog didn't survive. But Bill was a dog lover, too, and there are pictures of his, his dog as well. Now, what did, what did Dr. Wallace like? Dr. Wallace loved ice cream. He loved ice cream. Every time uh, there was an event, he would always say, we have to have ice cream, and all the Chinese loved ice cream. So they would, he would promise that they would have ice cream, and Everly would have to make it in the old-fashioned crank uh, fa fashion there. So here she is telling about making it because Bill, uh, Dr. Bill likes it there. And on an uh, occasion or two, she had nothing to flavor it with except Ovaltine. Uh, some of you may have know Ovaltine or, or know about it. It's a chocolate milk drink, so she flavored it with good old Ovaltine. Now, Dr. Bill had a orange boat built, motor boat that he took on the river. How am I doing, Mrs. Walker? I got to wind it up. Okay. <laughs> I got to wind it up. He <laughs> I'm going to have to jump ahead. He, he had uh, a, an orange motor boat built because he was from Tennessee, and he had a surfboard also built uh, because that's the 19, as he's grown into the 1950s, and it was time for Frankie Avalon and all the surfing movies to come about. And so he was on the, the, the edge of being at that, that point. Now, let me jump quickly to Everly Hayes in 1950. So there, there, there's very little that she says, except in this, this letter of December the 26th, 1950, and this is the paragraph that she mentions there. Uh, not to worry too much uh, about me, though you probably have good reason. Just continue to pray for us, for Bill, and I think this is interesting. She drew a line through Bill and put Dr. Wallace there. There. He's being detained. Needless to say uh, that things are rather difficult. Uh, let me jump back. Notice already, if I can get it here, the communist stamp of Mao is already appearing on the, on the envelopes. All right, during the time that he's detained, uh, the senators from Kentucky are trying to appeal to the State Department, and this astounded me in the, in the documents. Here's a memorandum from uh, Kefever to this to this minister, but here's the name. I also talked to Dean Rusk. Who was Dean Rusk? Dean Rusk became Secretary of State. Dean Rusk is the guy, when he was in the Army, he was a lieutenant. He is the one who created North and South Korea. That's how it got started. So he's ve he was very influential. He knew the, he knew the, the communists, he knew the Chinese. And he try, obviously they tried to intervene in some way there. From her letters go from every three days to almost non-existent. And notice her letters to home have changed greatly because now they're in Chinese and English. They're being 
watched all the time. She's under house arrest. She doesn't say much. The weather's good. I'm singing. I'm praying. I'm reading. But nothing is really going on there that she can say. Obviously, it's past the time in which Bill is, uh, has died. So nothing really much there. All right, so here is a letter that she sends home. Finally, she's out. There's nothing really there until August of 1951. Already, it's been months and months and months. She's been under house arrest, and she's finally out there. And what's interesting here is she gets only like 48 hours notice or less that she's able to leave. Gets a knock in the middle of the night. You, are, you must leave. You have to get on the boat. And so she takes off uh, for Hong Kong. So she goes to, to the uh, um, Baptist uh, mission in Hong Kong there. She rings the doorbell, uh, what, we thought, what she thought was the Culpepper's, and she didn't know what Mrs. Culpepper looked like. And this is her recant, her account there. When Mrs. Culpepper opened the door, she looked as, uh, as, as if I was thinking, who on the earth is this tramp? Because a lot of refugees were coming in there. And she didn't know who I was. And of course, uh, she asked, does Dr. Culpepper live there? And it dawns on her, on Mrs. Culpepper, that's Everly Hayes. She's managed to get out of, and it's quite a rejoicing that they had. So they made a contact. She was the last one to get out of, uh, of, of China at that time. And so we have uh, a letter from her to Dr. Dr. Cawthon, and it we have it here. And because of our time, I won't go in much further, but if you want to take time and read it and come by and see it, this is the copy, and Dr. Uh, Fletcher used this, but it actually is the, the blow by blow of what happened the night he was arrested, taken away in his pajamas. They sent food to him, but it was returned, and um, they accused him of having a gun under his bed, which he did not own a gun. And they were all the nurses and uh, Chinese doctors were in different parts of the building having to explain different equipment. So it was a plant. He never had a gun, but that was their reason that they gave for arresting him. And <coughs> he... Uh, there was a, uh, a messenger who was sent to Everly Hayes that to come at, to the hus to, to the prison because Dr. Wallace had passed, and she had to go with another uh, Chinese servant to to identify the body there, and they say the Chinese say that he was. Hung, that he hung himself, but he, we believe that that's very unlikely because Dr. Wallace gave his life so much to the mission work. He had been deprived of food. We know from the accounts of the person who dressed his body for burial that he had been whipped with canes and that they had used, uh, um, they had shocked him with the electric wires uh, during the whole two-week period and that he had been burned there and his body was all bruised there. And we believe that he, he probably did pass, but there were other missionaries who were Catholic in the same uh, prison at the time and some of them say, well, that he really did commit suicide. Matter of fact, a bishop, a Catholic bishop, says that it's excusable, it was an excusable suicide, which is, I was surprised. There, and I'll show you that document. So they take uh, Dr. Wallace's uh, body, and it was uh, put in the old Christian cemetery out about two miles away, and the uh, 
the nurses and the doctor, Chinese doctors of the hospital gathered the fund to pay for his coffin, to, to do the grading. This was just a hillside. The Badeau's uh, infant child was buried nearby. And this was a cement monument that they put up for him. At the time of the burial, they could not have a ceremony. They couldn't pray. They couldn't say anything at all. They could just walk by and throw dirt in, into it. There were four soldiers there at the time that he was buried. And this is the letter from the, the Catholic bishop that gives his account of the night that he passed and that uh, they distributed water and he, they had not heard anything. Then his food, food came and at that point uh, the prison trustee more or less uh, goes out screaming that Dr. Wallace had hung himself. But this Catholic bishop had also been persecuted as well. So in my mind, did he have clear comprehension of what actually happened? I think there's a possibility that someone could have slipped by his cell and um, done something, had actually pushed Bill's body up and hung it up so that it would look like he had committed suicide. Nevertheless, this bishop did not want to write anything until 1987 because he felt like that Bill had committed suicide, but he respected him so much. And down here in the bottom, he, had not, he did not want to really discredit Bill's life in any way. And so he refused to write to some other Catholic priest on this matter because he so admired Bill. All right, then <clears throat> Bill's body actually does come home because um, Cornelia Level, who was a missionary child, grew up in China uh, and retired, le learned that his body was still there and connected with the Stiegel family. They de decided to go to China, and they were able to go to Wuchow with the documents that they had secured, and they were able to bring Bill's body back. But it was, but it was a cremation. They would not allow his bones or, to come out, and I think they wanted no evidence. That's my view. By, by cremation, it would be very hard to do anything. So but at least they got to, to bring him home. The reason why they were willing to do so, the old Christian cemetery was being plowed over for a high rise. And so the bodies were being removed from there. And so they had a ceremony in Knoxville and the Chinese nurses that he had trained had, some of them had managed to immigrate to, uh, back to the United States. Many of them lived in Los Angeles. And there are the nurses that were there the night he was arrested. And so they had a ceremony. And this is where he's laid to rest in Knoxville. Now, the, the nurses paid for this uh, granite monument. And on it, it says, for me to live is Christ. And on the other side, it's in, in Chinese as well. And they are the ones who, who paid for it. And so he comes back to the United States finally. And the, one of the doctors was trying to decide what should go on his, on his tomb. And that's when they decided that one, for me to live as Christ. And so that's our bill. I know our time is short. I invite you to, to look at any of the items so we can visit afterwards if anyone wants to visit. And there are more coffee and cookies. And the Wallace Memorial Baptist Church has kindly supplied us with multiple copies of the book as well as copies of the movie. And you're welcome to take those for free. And thank you again for coming and being patient. <laughs>